Thank you, David, very much. And thank you all for the kind invitation to join you again for one of your gospel webinars. It's great to see the interest that there is in hearing God's word. I'd like to read two places with you uh, this evening. The first is in the gospel of Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. This is the Matthew's account of the crucifixion of Jesus. And we'll look at verse 44, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 44. If you want to follow along, I'm reading from the New English translation, the NET. And Matthew 27 and 44 says this. The robbers who were crucified with him also spoke abusively to him. So Jesus wasn't the only one crucified that day. There were others crucified, two robbers. And Matthew says they spoke abusively to him. Now, one other reading, please, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. This is Luke's account of the crucifixion. And he shares with us something that has happened since. Matthew recorded those words that the thieves were speaking abusively of Jesus. Something happened. So think about that as we share this reading together. Luke 23, verse 39. One of the criminals who was hanging there railed at him, railed at Jesus, saying, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him. He's had a bit of a change of mind. But the other rebuked him, saying, don't you fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we, rightly so, for we're getting what we deserve for what we did. But this man, Jesus, this man, he has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, some translations have him saying, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. I want to speak about Calvary's first convert, an unlikely convert, a man who was a criminal, the first person saved at the cross. Maybe you heard the story about the, the parish priest, Father Owens, so the story goes. You, you read these stories and you wonder if they're really true or not, but he was being honored at a, at a dinner on the 25th anniversary of his pastorate. A leading local politician who was a lawyer and a member of the priest congregation was going to give the keynote speech that evening. But when the cer ceremonies began, he was nowhere in sight. Not there. A message was uh, soon relayed informing the priest that the politician had been delayed in court and he would arrive as quickly as he could. So in order to fill the time, the priest decided to give an impromptu speech and just delay things enough before the arrival of the politician. So he told this story. He said, when I first came here 25 years ago, I thought I had been assigned a terrible place. He said, he said, the, he said the very first person the very first person who entered the confessional booth told me how he had stolen a TV and when he was stopped by a police officer, thought about murdering the officer. And further, he told me that he had embezzled money with his partner's wife and on and on and on the, the, the sins were confessed to me. And he, he said, I was appalled. I thought, if this is just the first person, what will all the others in this congregation be like? Well, he went on for as long as he could and eventually the politician burst through the door and proceeded to the platform full of apologies. And then he began his keynote speech. He said, I'll never forget the first day our pastor arrived in this parish. He said, in fact, I had the honor of being the very first person, the very first person to go to him in the confessional booth. Now, when I read that story, I thought, wow, it must have been quite a humiliating thing for that man to realize that everyone knew 
Everyone knew that man sins. Everyone knew his crimes. Now, one of the humiliating things about crucifixion, and there were many things that were humiliating about it, but one of them was that the criminal's crimes were posted above their heads for everyone to see. As humiliating as it was to be stripped and nailed to a cross and everybody to look at your pain on top of it, above your head, were your crimes so that people could walk by and look up and, 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 and say, he's there because he did this. He's there because he did that. And these criminals crucified with Jesus would have had charges written above their heads. Their crimes were noted and everyone could see. Thieves, robbers, insurrectionists. In fact, even Jesus had something above his head. But it wasn't really a crime. It wasn't a sin. He was the sinless son of God. But above his head read this charge. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And he was. Now, as these men were dying, they piled even more sins to the list of their crimes. Sins against God. Because Matthew told us, in fact, if we had read Mark's account of the crucifixion, we would, we would note it in his account also that both of these thieves were taunting and mocking Jesus. They were speaking abusively of him. They were joining in with what the crowd was saying. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. If you're the king of Israel, come down and we'll believe you. And they were mocking him. Both of the thieves were, but something happened. Now, one of the men persisted in his taunt, but the other soon had a change of heart and mind. And that's what we read about in Luke's account, Luke chapter 23. Something happened to this man. He would become Calvary's first convert. How? Well, we're going to look at the, the last words of these men hanging on these three crosses. The last words of dying men are always enlightening. We, we fasten our attention to the final things that people say. In fact, I've known uh, three, three people over the last few days that have passed away. And the, and the last words that some of them spoke, are, are we, we take them to be so significant, don't we? The last words of dying people are so important. So I want you to think of the last words of these three men as they're hanging on these three crosses. I won't take too much time to speak about the first thief. We'll call him thief number one. But when we hear him speak, we hear, we hear a dying man's panic. And then we'll spend most of the time looking at the second thief. And we will hear a dying man's prayer. He prays to the Lord. And what a good prayer to offer. And then at the end of the meeting, We'll look at the last words of the Lord Jesus, some of his last words. And we not so sure we could ever say he was a dying man, but he was about to die. But I want you to think about a dying man's promise. The promise that Jesus gave. Today you will be with me in paradise. But let's think first of that of thief number one. His last words. You notice the last recorded words that we have of him are these. Save yourself and us. He turns to Jesus to the extent that he might be able to fasten to the cross. And he says, save yourself and us. Can you hear the panic in his voice? This man has just hours, maybe moments to live. And he is in absolute panic. Save yourself, Jesus. And uh, why is he asking Jesus to save himself? Well, to his mind, Jesus would have to save himself first physically so that he can save them physically from their crosses. See, the problem with, in this man's mind is that he was only thinking about this life. He was just thinking about this life. That's evident from his final words. He, he says, save yourself and us. In other words, get us off these crosses. I don't want to die. I'm not ready to die. He is in full-scale panic. And he's just thinking about this life. 
Can I ask you, friend, listening just now, are you thinking beyond this life? Are you just thinking about this life? And let me ask you another question. If you knew, if you knew that today were your last day on earth, would it be panic? Would your last words give evidence of panic? Or do you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ? The three men that I knew that passed away over the last few days all had peace with God. There was no panic when they passed. They were at peace. Listen, you can be at peace when you pass from this life if you have Christ as your Savior. He's the only one who can give it to you. And that's what this other thief was about to learn. But this first man, there's absolute panic in his voice. Save yourself and us. How much better it would have been if he had just turned to Jesus and said, Lord, save my soul. He would have had peace. I really want to focus, though, on this second thief. Not now a dying man's panic, but a dying man's prayer. Something has changed. He's gone from speaking abusively to Jesus to straightening out his friend, first of all. His friend says, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. And he interjects. He says, wait a minute. He rebukes him, the Bible says. And he says, don't you fear God? Don't you fear? You're under the same sentence of condemnation that he is, that I am. We're all getting ready to die here, and we deserve it. We deserve it. Me and you deserve it, he says to his companion in crime. He's likely a companion in crime. He says, we deserve this. And he says, but this man, this man has done nothing wrong. What? And then he, then he turns to Jesus and he prays these words, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Okay, what happened? <laughs> what happened to this man? Sometimes an unexpected insight can make us shift our outlook. And this man had seen things that no one had ever seen before. Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he recalls a ride that he took on a New York subway one Sunday morning. People were sitting quietly, reading. Some were dozing. Others were just relaxing, resting. And then a man and his children entered the subway car and everything changed. <laughs> They were noisy, they were running around, they were uh, fiddling with things, and they were disturbing everyone, and the whole climate of that subway car changed. Finally, Stephen Covey had enough, and he turned to the man, and he said, sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you couldn't control them a little bit more, please? The man just softly replied, his eyes kind of far away. He said, oh, you're right, I, uh, I guess I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital. Their mother passed away about an hour ago, and I don't know what I'm going to do next, and they're probably having a hard time with it also. And just like that, Stephen Covey's attitude changed. And now he's looking at these children not as nuisances, but suddenly his heart goes out to them. He's, he's filled with compassion toward them, right? This new insight into the man's situation gave him, Covey says, such a jolt that he says, I suddenly saw things differently. And because I saw differently, I thought differently, I felt differently, I behaved differently. Now, this man who had been speaking abusively of Jesus had been given quite a jolt by the things that he saw. I, I'm not sure how much he witnessed, but he witnessed enough about the behavior of Jesus on this crucifixion day that was enough to change him forever. You see, here was a man led to that cross, Jesus, led to the place of execution, who acted unlike anyone has ever acted before. Those that were led to the cross, including these two thieves themselves, were likely shrieking and yelling and cursing those soldiers that were driving them there. And when they would get to the place, they would be fighting doing everything they could to keep their hands and feet from being pierced through to the wood beneath them. Not Jesus. Maybe he saw it. He saw a man extend his hands without any struggle at all. And he, saw, he allowed them to take his feet. 
and drive those spikes through them. And he didn't fight them. And he didn't curse them. And he didn't scream. You know what he did? And he did it repeatedly. The Bible tells us that he said over and over again, Father, I imagine Jesus' eyes went up to heaven. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They were crucifying God's son. And he was willing that they might be forgiven of such a terrible crime. This thief sees it. He'd never seen anything like this before. And while Jesus is on the cross, people are coming up to him and they're making fun of him and they're taunting him and they're mocking him and they're saying, come down and we'll believe. And what? Did, and he, he continues to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He had never seen a man like this before. And it gave him such a jolt that he started to see things differently. This man is, is different than any man he had ever seen before. And he started to get a very clear look at both himself and this man on the center cross. So I want, you to, I want you to notice some of the things that he saw about Christ, that he noticed about Christ that no one else seemed to notice. He did. For one, he, he notices that Jesus is innocent. Did you hear what he said? He said, this man, he says, we deserve what we're getting. And then he says to his friend, this man has done nothing wrong. He saw righteousness in Jesus. He saw that Jesus was righteous, that he was just, that he was innocent. Oh, I don't know how much he knew about the events of that day, but he knew this. Whatever reason it was that Jesus was being crucified, he was not guilty. He was not He was innocent of the charges that were against him. He saw righteousness. In Jesus. But number two, he saw royalty in Jesus. Saw royalty in Jesus. Did you hear what else he said? When he prays, he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Kingdom. There's a crown on Jesus' head as he's hanging on a cross, but it's made of thorns. But this man realizes that Jesus is going to wear another crown. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, how does he know about a kingdom? Well, I have to say something about these, these two thieves. A likelihood is, is that these two men crucified with Jesus were Jews. I mean, Jesus himself was born a Jew. Roman citizens were not crucified. They were not allowed to be crucified. A likelihood is these men were Jews. And this man had an understanding of his Bible, his Old Testament what we call the Old Testament now. He had an understanding that of his, and in the Bible, he would know that his own people, the Jewish people, were expecting a king to come, a Messiah to come and deliver them and inaugurate a kingdom that would last forever. That's found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. A kingdom that would come and last forever. And you know what he realizes? That, that kingdom, is going to be headed up by the man that's hanging next to me. He's the king. He's the Messiah. He's the savior. Can I ask you, have you ever recognized that that's who Jesus is? That he's the savior. That he's the, he's the promised one. He's come to save his people from their sin. And to set up a kingdom. Not just a physical kingdom someday. And he will set it up, a literal earthly kingdom. But a spiritual kingdom that we can enter into the moment we're born again, the more moment we receive him as our savior, we enter into the kingdom of God's dear son. Well, this man realized that Jesus is royalty, that he's going to establish a kingdom. Now that's amazing because the disciples went around expecting, and they were expecting the coming kingdom of Christ. They were proclaiming that that kingdom had come. Where are the disciples now here at the cross? They're nowhere to be found. They're gone. And the cry of the multitude that was at the cross, they were all saying, we, we have no king but Caesar. In fact, they hated that title that Pilate had put above the head of Jesus that says, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. But this man, 
This thief actually believed the title above the head of Jesus. And he turns to Jesus. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he saw royalty in Jesus. That's remarkable. He saw righteousness in Jesus. He saw resurrection in Jesus. How did he? Why does he say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom? Doesn't he know Jesus is about to die? When you go to a cross, you die on it. That's right. You do. And they did. But he knew. He knew. Somehow this thief knew that this would not be the end for Jesus. Now to other people looking on, the only thing that they could expect Christ to receive on this day was a coffin, a grave, not a kingdom. But this man knew somehow this is not the end. Somewhere, somehow, sometime he will be alive. He will rise and enter into his kingdom. And when it does happen, he says, Lord, remember me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Again, the disciples were told that he would rise again. They didn't believe him and they're not here. But this man did believe him. This man did believe that Christ would rise and set up a kingdom someday. He saw resurrection in Jesus. Finally, he saw redemption in Jesus. He saw redemption in Jesus. We've been arguing that he's Calvary's first convict. I'm not sure how much he witnessed, but there did come a time. There did come a time when the orders were given to hasten the death of these three victims. And so the soldiers came with a club. And what they would do is they would break the legs of those that were on the crosses. And when their legs were broken, they couldn't push up with their feet to get more breath. And eventually they would just suffocate under their own weight. And so sure enough, the soldiers came. I don't know who was first. Maybe it was his companion in crime that was first. And if so, he heard an awful thud and he heard a shriek of pain. And then it was his turn. And then they came to Jesus. The soldiers came to Jesus to break his legs too. But when they did, they saw that he was dead already. And so they didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear, the Bible says, pierced his side. And from the side of Jesus flowed precious blood. And the thief would have seen that precious blood flowing from Jesus' side. And this is what the hymn writer says. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Something happened to this man on this day. He realized that there's redemption in Jesus, that there's salvation in him. And he puts his faith in this Savior hanging next to him and becomes Calvary's first convert. And it's, rem it's remarkable to think about the fact that the very first convict at the cross, the very first convert at the cross was a convict. Now, I just want to end by telling you something about Jesus' words. We don't want to miss his words. All the words in the story of these three thieves, his words are the most important. And we don't have now a dying man's panic like the first thief. Lord, save us from these crosses. Get us down. Save our lives. We don't have a dying man's panic, and we're not even now considering a dying man's prayer. But we have, a, uh, if, you, if I can call him, a dying man's promise. Jesus was about to die, but before he does, he gives this man a promise. Here's what he says to him. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. What a beautiful promise. Now, I just want, want you to think of three things here. He says, today, today, you'll be with me in paradise. He doesn't say, you know, in just a few days from now, or in a few years from now, or 
far off in the future will be together in heaven. No, he says today, so much sooner than this man anticipated. Now, when Jesus says that, for one, he shows his omniscience. That just means that as God, he knows everything. Jesus knew everything. You know what? Jesus knew that they were both going to die on that specific day and they would be together in paradise. He knew they were both going to die that day. Now, that was unusual because many times crucifixion victims could last a few days before dying. How did that thief know that the soldiers would come out with the with the clubs to break their legs and, and hasten their death? He wouldn't have known that necessarily because sometimes crucifixion victims would be hanging on crosses for days before they eventually expire. But Jesus turns to him and he says, it won't be days. Your pain is almost over. In fact, this very day, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Here, this man was thinking too about coming into Christ's kingdom. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That day that is far off from now, Jesus says, this very day, you'll be with me in paradise. Can I just stop and, and, and say to everyone listening tonight, this very day, this very day, you could be with Christ in heaven. If something were to happen to you, if you were to leave this life, and listen, it happens all the time. Again, three people that I've known in three days have passed. And right now, all three of them are with Christ in heaven. The Bible says that when a believer dies, when someone who is saved dies, that we go to be with Christ, which is far better, far better than being here. I don't even think I need to tell you that. It's far better than being here. But listen, do you, you could know today that if you were to die, you would be with Christ. But you have to have Christ as your Savior. He was on that cross for our sins. He was on that cross. He was hanging there for us. He was, he was righteous. There was no reason why he should die in and of himself. He was without spot, without guilt. He was there for us. He was there to be punished in our place. The Bible says that when Jesus was on the cross, that, that the Lord laid on him the iniquity, the sins of us all. He was there to bear punishment that we deserve so that we could be with him in paradise. And so Jesus says, today, so much sooner, today, you'll be with me in paradise. But then he says, today, you will be with me. Today, you shall be with me. He doesn't say, you know, there's a possibility that things might work out for you today. It's a promise. He says, it's going to happen. You will be with me today. So much sooner, so much surer. Oh, that's a word, surer. See, it was the hope of this man that, that he would be remembered by Christ. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I hope he remembers me. I hope he hears my word. What assurance when he heard right away, immediately from Jesus, today you will be with me in paradise. What a great promise. And listen, God's word is filled with promises that we can receive that assure us salvation the moment we receive God's son, that assure you that you could have salvation at this very moment if you were to receive God's son by faith. Here's what the Bible says. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's a promise. How sure that promise is, I'm glad for it. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. The Bible says, he that believes on the Son has everlasting life. These are promises that can change your life if you were to receive them by faith today. And so he says, today, so much sooner, you shall be with me, so much surer. And finally, he says, today you shall be with me in paradise, with me in paradise, so much sweeter than he thought. He's, 
He's thinking of a kingdom someday far in the future. Jesus says, oh, there's something sweeter than that. It's to be with me this very day in paradise. How sweet is that? Well, what a change of circumstances this man was about to experience. Right now, he was with Christ in pain, hanging on a tree with Christ in pain. Jesus says, just a little bit longer today, with Christ in paradise. How much sweeter is that? I'm, you know, if something were to happen to me tonight, I know that I would be with Christ in heaven. And listen, when people say that, it might surprise you. Listen, it's not because I did anything. I didn't do anything. I sinned against God and I'm guilty. But I'm, I can say that because Christ died on the cross for my sins. And he promises that the moment we accept him as our personal savior, our sins are forgiven and we receive everlasting life. And so that's what gives us assurance to be able to say, if something were to happen to me tonight, I know that I would be with Christ in heaven, which is far better. Do you have that assurance? Do you have that assurance? If you don't, don't settle for anything else. Don't settle for being 50% sure, 90% sure of being right with God. You can be 100% confident that your future is secure in heaven with the Lord Jesus because God's word says so. He gives us his promises. And so this was Calvary's first convert. Calvary has had, Calvary has had many converts since. I'm thankful by God's grace to be one of them. I didn't do anything to deserve it. I sinned, but Christ died for me. I'm thankful that by God's grace, I'm one of them. Will you be one of them? Will you die like that panicked thief and land in hell? Or will you die like this praying thief and go to heaven? There are no other places. We can't stay here. We're leaving. And we either go up to paradise or down to the pit. What made the difference for these two men? What made the difference is what they did with the man on the middle cross. One of them refused him and perished. One of them received him and received with him life everlasting. You can enter into the good of his promise too. The promise Jesus made that thief, you can take for yourself just now. The qualifier is you have to be a convict. You have to be a sinner. And if you're a sinner, you can take this promise for yourself. Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. We pray that you'll trust the Savior just now.